You know, life for me has been a lot. It's been a roller coaster, up and down, a lot of turmoil, like a lot that people, if they understood what I've been through and what I've seen, you know, a, a lot of loss to where it can affect you as a person and it can make you angry. You know, but then when you realize, like, the only thing promised in this life is death. Resilience is a necessity for success. I'm here, in New Jersey, just flew in this morning. We started off with an early flight from Atlanta with some of my students. I've got one of our guys, Quincy, over here, AKA my bodyguard while I'm here. Also got Jerry, he's taking the photos. The BTS photos over there. The first day was awesome, you know? We got here, we had a full day. We came up, drove in, met with Tom, had lunch, wonderful lunch, Red Lobster lunch, with uh, his son. We came in and participated in Tom's uh, 530 No Gi class. Classes were packed, it was great energy. Had a bunch of visitors from, you know, different schools. To their knees, you're gonna get that back, all right? So just be very careful. When you're rolling through knees, don't do it mindless. Understand what you're doing. All right, go. After that, my students and I went out, you know, to some local spots, had some local food, had some beers, had a great time. We had a great night. West Virginia! Guys, shut up and eat. We found a southern uh, restaurant, southern breakfast and lunch restaurant up here in New Jersey. I'm, I'm telling you, this is in New Jersey. We're stuck somewhere like in this uh, whirlwind of uh, lies and somewhere out in Kennesaw, Georgia. But check this out. Look at this. Look at this. Look at these omelets. Look at that. Corned beef hash, toast, meat lovers. And then we have French toast over here with peanut butter. We got pancakes. Look at, look at the table full. Cause she even brought to Lua. Goodness, she knows what she's doing. All right, now get out of here. We gotta eat. We actually went to the boardwalk where Jersey Shore was uh, filmed back in the days. Walked the boardwalk a little bit. You know, got to take in Jersey for what it is. Uh, we're up here by the docks and we're not on the beach because first of all, they charge $10 per person to get on the beach and I'm not paying $10 to get on. We're used to the Florida beaches where you just walk on, you can take your coolers, your beers. I don't even know if that's legal here or not. But anyway, so now I'm waiting on Tom. We're going to hang out at his house. It's a personal invitation to hang out. I'm gonna be jumping in the pool, get in depth get to know Tom a little bit more and let the viewers know about everything that uh, Tom and I actually got going on. First of all, Tom, thanks for having me here in Jersey. You've been a gracious host and in your home today. Uh, tell me how, how you're doing this morning. I'm good, brother. Uh, I usually don't have people in for seminars, right, ever. I've had, the only other seminar that I have has been uh, Gordon. And then years ago, after 2009 ADCC, I had uh, Kira Gracie here for my ladies. Oh, and then I had Lucas Leach and Tatra Barrow, but, uh, yeah, you're the first guy that... Uh, that is uh, it's an honor. First of all, that's uh, unheard of. And uh, I'm very excited for tonight. Uh, but before we get into what we're going to be doing, I just want to... I want our viewers to kind of know Tom DeBloss. So we want to try to cover as much as we can. We want to know Tom DeBloss today. We want to start off with where Tom came from. You know, your childhood, your upbringing, and uh, your encounter with martial arts and jiu-jitsu. Let's start with that. I was a really nice young boy. Like I always say, like uh, life has taken me through a lot of ebbs and flows and I had to become somebody that I, I wasn't naturally. Like I was a soft kid. I, I was a kid, I'd watch like uh, 
the Care Bears and I cried. You know, when I watched Dumbo, when he got his, his, his flag broken, I cried. Like things would deeply affect me. I guess they call that an empath. I had a very close relationship with my family, with my parents, but my dad was a drug addict and alcoholic. Uh, and he would never, the only time he was sober in my life was between like six months old and two years old. After I got taken home from the hospital, uh, my mom got a call the next week. My dad overdosed on heroin in uh, Harlem. So she thought he was dead, actually. She went to go find him. He was actually walking down the street in his hospital gown. They, they called the wrong guy. So he actually disappeared for a few months uh, and came back when I was around six months old. And he was sober between six months and two years old. And we moved to a, a small apartment and uh, he never stayed sober again for longer than like a month. You know, I, I've seen my dad go through probably like a hundred rehabs. And the hard part was he was such an amazing guy when he was sober and his heart was pure, but he just had an addiction that had a stronghold on him, you know? And I get it because my personality is very similar to his in many ways, but with the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of him being, everything's good, we're like one big happy family, then the next day he's high and drunk and he's very nasty. When he would get sober, like my mom and I would kind of just act like nothing was wrong, right? So it's like we would go from like this crazy turmoil to everything just being normal. And that started really messing with my head. And at a young age, I, I developed almost a friendship with both my mother and my father. I was the peacemaker, you know, like when I was there, I'd make sure everything was okay. And just really started taking a heavy toll on me because I never cared about how I felt, things he would say to me, but when I would hear them argue, when he would say hurtful things to my mom, that would really affect me like bad. And there are certain specific things that I remember until this day. And, uh, you know, I, I just really would, I would hate to see my parents suffer. And I would feel so bad after he would get sober again because I know how bad he felt. And I would just try to tell him like, dad, I forgive you, it's okay, you know? But this really, really took a heavy toll on my mental health. At about 12, 13 years old, like I was bullied in the neighborhood and stuff like everybody is. But about 12, 13 years old, I had to become somebody that I, I was in in order to just survive, in order to be okay. Uh, I had to kind of shut off any kind of, uh, I tried to shut off any empathy or any, uh, any feelings, you know, and it, I really didn't trust anybody and I became more of a, like a savage type kid. And, uh, but I still never hurt anybody for no reason. I, I started losing myself, you know, and I think basically my entire life has been up and down as far as that's concerned. Like, you know, some people don't understand me because I'm so kind and compassionate. And then in the same sense, like, you know, I, I do believe in violence, right? And I don't think it's that hard to understand. I dealt with a lot. Like we hear hurt people hurt people, but that was never an excuse for me. I was hurt a lot in my life and it never made me take out my anger on somebody else. So I had no feelings for people who would take their anger and frustration out on innocent people. It would make me very, very upset. So I feel, you know, life for me has been a lot. It's been a roller coaster, up and down, a lot of turmoil, like a lot that people if they understood what I've been through and what I've seen, my best friend when I was 25, he was murdered. Um, one of my best friends growing up uh, a few years after that overdosed on heroin. Just a lot of loss, you know, a, a lot of loss to where it could affect you as a person and it can make you angry, you know? But then when you realize like, the only thing promised in this life is death and you can't get angry. Getting angry or being upset, it literally only hurts you. That's it because you just sit there with this burning pit in your stomach for what? So I was actually a track and field athlete. I was a long jumper, a long jump close to 23 feet, ran the 110.9, high jump 6.5, and then I tore every ligament in my jumping ankle. So I always liked to fight, like I fought my whole life. I grew up fighting. My dad was a very, very good fighter. I know it's a you know, typical, oh, you know, street fighter. He was, he was a bad dude. He would take bricks, like the red bricks when he would get drunk put him flat on the ground, hit him and shatter him. Like he was just a strong guy. My grandfather used to uh, bend railroad spikes. Like I was the weakest physically in my family. But look at you, <laughs> you, don't, you don't physically. That's what's crazy, you know? And I, you know, I just met with my cousin the other day, my first cousin on my mom's side. He's the starting linebacker for Penn State, 6'3", 240 and shredded. And I'm like, everybody's just good stock in this family genetically. And we were all aggressive guys, you know? So I had this aggression within me but I never liked to fight for no reason, but I would fight a lot, whether it be play fighting, fooling around fighting. When I was going into college, when I tore my ligaments, I found Taekwondo. 
I started getting disqualified all the time because I was hitting too hard. So then I found mixed martial arts. I started training with this place called Tong Dragon. They're actually a local school, Eric Cologne, great guy. I, I ended up fighting MMA when I was only training for like six months. I was a white belt in Jiu Jitsu. I was just a tough kid. Uh, I didn't know anything. And uh, my opponent was supposed to be some guy named Richard Thomas with no fights. A week before that, he got hurt. And a guy, David Torelli, who was like number one mixed martial artist of the year in the Northeast, I think his record was like seven and three. He was, yeah, 40 years old. He took the fight and man, he he put, he dropped the hammer on me. They stopped the fight. Uh, he severely concussed me, broke my nose, really hurt me. And I remember I looked in the mirror the next day and I was like, you're all gonna pay. You know, like I'm not, you can't break me. Life has already broken me. You think you're gonna make me run. And I came back and I started training harder. And then I realized like, you know, I really love jujitsu. There's a guy, Ricardo Almeida, that lives in the state. Actually, Kurt Pellegrino. Kurt lived in Tom's River and he trained directly under Ricardo. I started training with Kurt. Kurt was a Pan American champion, a blue belt. And at that time, being a Pan American champion at any belt level was immense, you know, especially as a, an American. Besides Lovato at that time, I was one of the only Americans like a brown belt that was actually really winning. Go back, I was a white belt. I started training with Ricardo. Kurt and Ricardo had a falling out. I chose to stay with Ricardo because he really took a liking to me. As a white belt, I, I became Henzo Gracie's main sparring partner for BJ Penn as a white belt. You know, so I was just that tough, crazy kid that no matter how many times you beat him, he just keeps popping up like, like that, that bobble that just keeps coming back and forth. And I didn't know much, but I knew how to stay resilient. And eventually I actually started getting good. You know, Ricardo put a lot of time into me, everything. He was like the father. I had a father, but I had a father to tell me how to live, but he didn't live the way he said. So I, he, was, he was always do as I say, not as I do. Ricardo was do as I say and do as I do. And I took a lot of his positive qualities, his leadership, his stoicism, to where it didn't, it, it took me until 41 to finally get things in check, to kind of lose that hot head type thing. My fire and desire absolutely helped me get to where I am, but at the same time, it made me hit some roadblocks, you know? At that time, I just wanted to compete. I wanted to beat everybody. That's it. I started training jiu-jitsu, training jiu-jitsu. I fought again amateur, submitted the guy in the first round, kept the gi on, kept training because I wanted to make Ricardo proud, right? Uh, he won the Pan Ams in the brown belt division in the gi. <clears throat> I would get up at five in the morning, drive an hour to Ricardo's from Ricardo's, we would drive an hour and a half to Martin Rooney's house, the, the Precy Speed School, not his house, his facility. We would train strength and conditioning for about an hour and a half. Then there we would drive to Hanzo's another hour, train no gi for two hours, in Denner's class actually. <clears throat> then we would drive two hours back to Ricardo's. I would take a nap, eat, uh, wake up, teach class and take class again, and then get home by like 10 p.m. I would do that like five days a week. And I did this for a few years. I ended up competing in the the Pan American Games brown belt. I won my weight division, made him so proud. I was so thankful. I competed in the Nogi World brown belt. First Nogi Worlds ever, I won that. Uh, competed in the American Nationals, I won that. I competed in the, uh, the Mundial, the Gi division, uh, I took third. I went on to win the ABCC trials and it, it, was, it was history after that, you know, I, I started doing very well. And I, I fought MMA because I felt that's what I should do. I opened my school as a purple belt, got my brown belt the next month, won everything at brown belt. I was only a brown belt for a year got my black belt. The first year I got my black belt, I took third in the Nogi World's black belt division. I won the ADCC trial, so I did very well. But uh, still that empty pit in my stomach. I wasn't fulfilled. I, I, I just wasn't happy. I would put a smile on my face, but deep down, I, I don't know what it was. I, I, I just couldn't feel complete, you know? I, I envisioned things and I could just see myself like on my knees, broken, like it pouring outside and just somebody just whipping my back, man. I was just getting so beat down. I found a lot of pleasure in teaching my students, but I was still dedicated to myself, serving myself, self-serving through competition to where now, listen, if you're, I'm so far removed from competition, I don't even understand the mindset of a competitor because that's not me. And I look at it, it's like, I don't know how you could even want to do that. It's almost like hypocrisy because I was in it for so long. But now I realize in order for me to compete, I had to take so much time away from serving my students. Now it's hard for me to even train because I just watch, watch, watch. Like you saw yesterday, like my eyes are on everybody. And I stepped away from competition. I stepped away from MMA and became a full-time coach and dad. And finally I, I stood up again and everything felt okay. 
You know, I didn't feel a pit in my stomach anymore. I accepted the things that I couldn't change. Uh, I developed a close relationship with God. I started asking God for exactly what I want in life. And most of all, what I want in life is, is peace and wisdom and serenity. I changed a lot over the last year. At 41 years old, I feel I finally became a man. I might have hit monetary success and notoriety in my in my field, but before that, I wasn't a man because I, I, I didn't know exactly who I was. I know exactly who I am now, and, and I'm very comfortable with who I am, you know, and, and I'm very obsessed with serving people and helping people. And I think finding this new purpose and helping bullied kids uh, has really gave me a, a new purpose, more so beyond jujitsu. Jiu-Jitsu is just my way to be heard, and now helping people is really what I'm meant to do. I've learned a lot more from my losses than I have my wins, whether it be competition or training losses. Like, Jiu-Jitsu showed me, like, no matter what happens, it's always okay. Just come back the next day. You know, I always say one win can erase a thousand losses. Like, I've taken so many beatings on those mats. My heart has been broken on those mats, and I went through some really heavy things in life. I, I gotta tell you, Nothing is worse than losing if you allow it to be until you realize it's only what you allow it to be. And once you realize losing in Jiu-Jitsu, there's really no such thing. Yes, in competition, there's a winner or a loser. But again, like, it's kind of fickle because when you lose, you can win the next competition. When you win, you can lose the next competition. So it's basically the preparation you put forth that makes you who you are. And jiu-jitsu, for me, it became a constant. It be, it's like I've, I've always been abandoned in my life. Uh, jiu-jitsu doesn't leave me. So a lot of people are loyal to jiu-jitsu. A lot of people, jiu-jitsu is loyal to them. But are you loyal to jiu-jitsu? I don't look at jiu-jitsu as just a thing. I look at jiu-jitsu as it's my essence. It, it, it's a part of, of life. It, I owe jiu-jitsu, almost like it, it, it has feelings. And if I, if I sway from jiu-jitsu, I'm betraying something that's always loved me. And it showed me tough love. It showed me softness. It showed me everything, but it's taught me more than anything has ever taught me. It, it taught me that resilience is a necessity for success. The great thing about jujitsu is, are you depressed? Jujitsu can help make you happier. You don't have any friends, jujitsu will give you family. You don't know how to defend yourself, jujitsu will help you. You're overweight, jujitsu will help you lose weight. So jujitsu has so many benefits. All I want to do is keep serving. I don't know what's next. Like, I do believe I'll keep growing. I'll keep getting bigger. Buddies Over Bullies is already international, and it's going to be bigger than ever. We're going to get therapists on board. We're going to get more than just jujitsu. I'll keep being involved with one. I'll, I'll keep growing my academy. We're getting more students every month. But I think what's next is there's just going to be more lives that I touch, you know? And jujitsu is always the root of that. Jujitsu will always be the reason. Like I always say, Ricardo, my teacher, without him, I wouldn't have the knowledge that I have, right? So he's always a root. What's up, everybody? My name is Tom DeBlast, and I am Matt Made. Being here, learning more about you, your goals, I mean, it almost puts in line along with me. And I think, I think we can do a lot of work together because at this point in my life and my career too, my, my only thing that I want to do is like exactly what you just said, you know, we want to empower people through jujitsu, you know, help more people, touch more lives. That's it. And we want to put a positive impact in this, you know, and in, in this world that we live in. Just finished up here teaching a seminar at Tom DeBloss' Academy, Ocean County Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Had a amazing time. Students were very welcoming. Tomorrow morning, we're leaving up to New York. I'm gonna be visiting a friend up there to do some more instructional videos, give him a surprise visit before we go home.
short trip, but it seemed like we spent the week up here, really got to know Mr. Tom DeBloss, and I think likewise, he, he, he got to know the true side of what I represent and what my goals are. And again, I can't wait to see what this relationship flourishes into. So you guys stay tuned. A lot more Matt made, a lot more projects down the pipe, and I can't wait to share it with you all. Now, gotta go.